the next week after that was very tough on on many in my household. And because we live in an old farmhouse, the rattling of the front door is a now associated with the FBI and the trial and all the angst and all the trials. If you, uh, if you banged and rattled on my front door, that's going to be what my family thinks of first. So not, it wasn't a day or two after the arrest, we had a neighbor show up, you know, banging on the door. And like he normally does, once a month, he comes by, he's a customer, and he, instead of coming to the office, he is a neighbor, and he likes to stop by and say hello and drop a check off. Innocent. But the tension in the house was palpable as people grab their pillows and their beds and it's, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning and it's like, what's going on? You know, several nights in a row, my daughters and my wife, you know, had various dreams and, and things that were similar to that. You know, somebody rattling the doors or some, you know, something, somebody coming or, or even, even as recently as last week, waking to a sense of a presence of this towering being standing next to the bed and not knowing if it's good or bad, but assuming since we didn't know it was bad, it was good. But there's that just awake in, in a dream state of something going on supernaturally. But I had, I did have a dream two nights in a row. I just remember that it was a demonic voice. It was in my conscious dream. I knew it was bad and it was very, very mumbled and unintelligible. I had the same dream the next night, except this time I could actually hear them. The voice now was intelligible, but still garbled and kind of deep, throaty, evil-sounding voice. And he said, the um, creation sucks, handcuffs for our enemies. <laughs> and I woke up, I said, I'm, bad. I'm like, that's it, really? That's, that's why you got your cosmic demonic force, and all you got to say is creation sucks and handcuffs? Is, that's, that's what you got. He's like, and I don't know, you know, I don't fully understand. I'm not a, a C.S. Lewis cosmology expert and understand the hierarchy of angels and demons and all the things that go into that. But in my mind, I'm imagining this is just some little imp that comes out on my nightstand or something that was, that was angry. I don't know. Uh, but it, it, was, it was almost, it was really encouraging, actually. <laughs> it was, I woke up thinking, okay, well, I, you know, I guess we got a battle here. I don't know. What, what are we going to do with this, this guy? Welcome to Stifled Cry. In this episode, we get to know Paul Vaughn. My dad grew up with two brothers, and uh, they moved from California, from Boonville. My grandfather had a logging company out there and ended up moving to Arkansas with some of his family. Had their own uh, dump trucks at like 16 and worked in the, in the business, and so they had their... You know, all the sports cars and everything all the all the kids would like growing up in the uh, 50s, I guess, in high school. Um, and my mom from Florida came from a divorced uh, family there. Her, her dad was a doctor, so she ended up back in the uh, 60s, I guess, heading to California from Florida and took a layover in Arkansas and never left. <laughs> and so I don't know much of the details of their meeting. Yeah, that's in a nutshell. So I grew up in church with my mom's side uh, before the divorce. They divorced when I was in high school. After the divorce, it was pretty much turmoil of, of youth and uh, bouncing around from living with a friend, and living with my dad, living with my mom, until I was able to get out of town and join the military, join the Navy, and go see the world. So because of the divorce and the anger and resentment of uh, a lot of those Things, having lived through that as a child, I was trying to deny the upbringing and deny that God existed because my theology didn't allow for hurt and pain and suffering and different things that we experience in life. Um, so in writing from God for 10 years and trying to deny his existence, there's really probably two stories that sum up the debauchery, the sin, and the hurt, and the pain that that lifestyle leads to ended up participating in an abortion. So obviously it's a very traumatic experience. And at the time I told myself I was just a modern American man, that this was a woman's right and a woman's choice. But of course that was just a pathetic excuse men use to 
shuck the responsibility that they should have for their actions. I was no different than anyone else that lives in the world without God. I knew, because my mom was a, still a strong Christian, and I knew of her involvement with a, in pro-life ministry. She had attended the Summer of Mercy event in Wichita, Kansas, which was one of the largest pro-life events in the, in the history of the nation. And so I knew what she would think about my actions. But I also knew the despair and the, the overwhelming sense of guilt uh, that I felt from those actions. And it left me with a, a real tangible sense of sin and depravity and ultimately death. There's another, you know, another providential story during that same period that God really set me on the um, path coming back to him. And that was the, the helicopter crash story. I was in the Navy. We flew on helicopters and I was scheduled on a flight that ultimately crashed and killed all eight crewmen. Uh, and I had got bumped that morning an hour before the, or two hours before that flight take off, took off. I was bumped to the first flight and went out an hour earlier than than that flight because the guy that held the position, that was a very uh, specialized position on the aircraft, and broke his arm the night before. So all kinds of things, when you look at that and that airplane crashes and you're on the flight schedule and you show back up on the flight deck and all your friends come out and look at you like you're a ghost because they had read that your name was on that flight that went down. Uh, and and you're realizing, you're thinking through things that, that, so did God will the guy before me to break his arm? Well, that seems kind of mean. But yet, had he not done that, I would have died. But then those people died. Well, and then what about the guy that took my place on the flight? What does God think about that guy? So all kinds of deep questions that you can't answer without God and without a theological construct uh, that, that works in the narrative of a creator that is loving and gracious and kind and wants the best for his creation. So I'd, when I got out of the Navy, I'd moved back to... Uh, didn't want to go back to the little town in Arkansas, so I ended up had a couple friends from the Navy that had moved to Dallas, the DFW area. So moved back there. But uh, it was really in, a, in a, a tough spot. Had My apartment had been robbed. Everything I owned was stolen, just in a bad part of Dallas, and uh, was just left empty as, as coming to the fullness of my own seeking. Uh, and, and I knew God was there, and I, I prayed this night one night in my apartment after everything was gone, and... Uh, I said, you know, God, I, I know you're out there. I know you're real. I know I've been trying to suppress that fact. I said, but I have nothing. I have nobody. I said, if you'll give me a friend, you know, to go to church with, this, I know what I need to do. Help me do it. You know, I, I, I believe, help my unbelief, you know, kind of a, a prayer. And it wasn't a deal making with God like, like you hear a lot of times. It wasn't like, okay, if you do this, I'll do this. It was, it was a really a desperation, like, you know, help me figure it out. And so the next morning, you get a knock on the door, and this police or a, a, a bench warrant for a, a hot check at some liquor store. <laughs> Without, I'm, I'm like, this is how you answer prayers? Is <laughs> I've cried out my heart to you, and, I, you know, I get, I get a, a, I got to go down and pay this hot check. And lo and behold, about the time I'm thinking this in my, in my head, you know, I, I'm rebuked instantly as my good friend Mike pulled in the driveway behind the police officer. Hey, what's going on? And so Micah followed us to the police station, paid off, we, you know, paid off the check and never went to jail or anything like that. But Mike was the one that God ended up using, uh, that he literally within a week or two had been going to church and was calling me up. Hey, man, I found this neat little church we're going to. You want to go? And so, uh, and at first I played him off, like, yeah, you know, not really. And then about the third time he asked, God, God quickened my heart. It's like, oh yeah, I asked that, didn't I? <laughs> that, was, oh, that was the answer. Okay. And so I ended up going to church with, with Mike and we were just, it was great. We we're good friends, good pool buddies. We, we were friends in high school and then, you know, we'd go out and, and play in pool tournaments and stuff and have had a, just had a real good relationship, good friendship. And I remember talking to the little Baptist pastor there in Arlington, Texas, and just having theological debates as, as I'm, you know, been to church three times, and now I'm like, but well, what about this? And, but it wasn't a, a debate necessarily. It was just questions of trying to figure things out. Anyway, God used him um, amazingly. I remember one day leaving there, and he had, the pastor had tears in his eyes, and it wasn't, 
my sense was, my takeaway in the spirit, that he recognized that God was doing something to me that I didn't recognize, perhaps, at the time. In that time period, a week or two later, and Mike and the other guys had come over, and there was a couple other extra folks from my, my uh, roommate's work, and one of them started asking questions about Christianity, about Christ, and they had the Bible out, and they were looking at stuff, and so I remember going through the Bible and going, no, but that's over here. If you look, if you read this, and I was answering questions to this complete stranger that I had never seen before out of the Bible, and it's like almost in an instant, they were gone. Like, okay, we're going out to the park, we're going to do our thing, or whatever, and I'm left in the apartment by myself with the Bible, and I'm thinking to myself, what just happened here? I'm not, I, I, I've been to church like twice, and, and here I'm, you know, helping reading the scripture, and that moment was the moment that God just really reached into my heart, and just, I broke down in prayer and weeping before God, and just said, you know, repentance, and and realized just all those stories that I just told leading up to that, how that was a, that was God's hand and all of that. So it's pretty pretty dramatic experience coming out of the divorce and the ten years and all the things that went into it. What was your mother's influence on you in that period of your life? Well, very little in that period because I was avoiding her. Like I said, that's not what people running from Christ do. They don't go to people that want to want to image Christ to them. But she was faithful, you know, throughout my childhood. Uh, she was consistent. She would go to church. Uh, you know, she cared for her children, you know, put up with a lot through, uh, through a bad marriage and all the things that single mothers end up having to go through. And so she's always, always been faithful. Every child-parent relationship always has its growing pains as, as children grow and, and all that. And certainly as I'm processing the pains of the divorce and all that, it was exaggerated and, and we weren't on good terms, but it wasn't because we weren't on good terms. It was because I was not on good terms with my creator and therefore, uh, you know, was strained to, to visit mom and talk to mom and such. I ultimately ended up moving to Houston and then going to church down there and going to the same church with my mom and brothers and with Rusty and his wife and kids. Rusty Thomas is the, uh, the pastor that uh, was ministering to me and, and, uh, his, and you know, brought me into his household and just really treated me like a son. God really used him to you know, strengthen my faith. And then we would go out and I'd go out on the streets with him preach and minister uh, to people at the abortion clinics, just not at an event or just, just going locally, sidewalk counseling, uh, things like that. And uh, we did the big pro-life drama that included a skit about rescue uh, where people were sitting at the door and, and really brought out. It was, a, it was a beautiful skit. It was, an, it was a nice, probably 45-minute hour drama, um, full, full-scale full play. That was you know, as far as anything large that we did were like a commitment other than, hey, do you want to go to the abortion clinic and pray today? What made you want to get involved in pro-life ministry? When God ultimately touched me and brought me out of my my sin and the, the, the deception I was living in, when those scales fell off and I was actually able to see uh, the truth of what was going on, it, it to me, that's what a Christian was, what a Christian deals with truth. And the truth is, those are babies. And so it's very natural to go out to an abortion clinic and tell people, hey, that's not the answer you're looking for. And it's not going to help you. And there is a better way. And it takes a little bit of work, but here's people that will help you and walk with you and minister to your actual needs, as opposed to taking your dollars and sending you on your way in the same misery that you arrived in. How did you meet your wife? Yeah, so we, uh, you know, Beth and I met on the streets in Dallas, actually, uh, at the event I was talking about that came after the GOP event, the uh, Cities of Refuge event. And uh, we got paired up. So one of the strategies uh, and, and really kind of a safety precaution and stuff is you normally would pair up a, a young man and a young woman, uh, usually younger and single, uh, that would be out on the streets, although husband and wife teams were awesome, you know, have out there. Uh, but uh, so Beth and I got paired up as a sidewalk counseling team out at the uh, Mockingbird Clinic uh, in Dallas is, is where we were first go. And I remember the Mockingbird because one of the couples we talked to was very hostile. And so I get shoved into a fence and threatened to have my face beat in by the dad, you know, the, the boyfriend and, and Beth over there talking with the girl that's crying. And, and I'm like, this is <laughs> the volatile ministry. Um, 
Bethany's father, David Hall, had a, he made 3,000 white crosses. They were about a foot tall and all made out of wood with stands painted white. And the idea back in, at that particular time, that was about the number of abortions a day uh, that were, were being done in the U.S. And so he created all these crosses. And so when we had an event, we go set out 3,000 crosses in a field. So when you're talking to people, you can say, well, did you see those crosses over that church? That's the number of children that died today. While you and I are having this conversation, while you went to work and I went here and we had our lunch and our dinner, 3,000 babies died. So it was a very visual representation uh, from a you know, from a ministry standpoint of being able to speak that truth and, and show a picture of that truth. But of course, the, the, the challenge to that is somebody had to put 3,000 crosses out and pick 3,000 crosses up at these events. And so that was, we, Beth and I laughed, that's our, our courtship was picking up crosses. Uh, Beth and I wrote back and forth back in the day. We'd fax letters back and forth since we didn't have uh, email and, and uh, texting uh, back then. The, uh, we, ended up, we'd, we did go to a Birmingham event uh, together before we were married. That was a neat event. That was the uh, over, I don't know, two or 300 Christians were arrested for praying on the sidewalk in front of an abortion clinic uh, where they used a Martin Luther King Jr. era civil rights law that if you had more than 20 people and a certain amount of footage on the sidewalk, that they would arrest you. And so we spent all day with 19 people praying and then one extra person would join them and they would get arrested and then 19 people would pray for another 10 minutes or so and then one person would join them. And so we just kind of cycled all the pro-lifers through the jail uh, for praying on the sidewalk uh, at that event. And uh, uh, just after the face bill had been signed, would have been 93, We ended up doing a rescue in Little Rock, Arkansas, where um, Jennifer Flowers aborted Bill Clinton's uh, child, as the the intel that the the leaders had on that. And so we rescued, got arrested, got processed out, went home, came back 30, 45 days later for the court date. And uh, the judge threw the book at us, said, he sentenced us to 30 days in jail, deemed we're a flight risk, sealed the courtroom, locked us up in our, you know, our, our Sunday best suits and, and, and stuff for court, and uh, hauled us directly to jail on, on that day. It was very much a, a, a Class B misdemeanor at the time is what rescues were, and it's very much a parking ticket, pay it and go home, uh, is the, the normal fare for something like that. Uh, so anyway, so we all get thrown in the, the slammer in, in Little Rock, Arkansas. They're releasing prisoners to make room for us. They were overcrowded. The, the big processing facilities where we get taken in, where they take the Friday night drunks in and all the sliding jail cell doors and, you know, the little concrete rooms. And they had all the ladies in one. And I want to say, I, I was looking recently at the numbers and I forget exactly, maybe 22 or 24 of us are, were, were thrown in jail. Of those, maybe eight ladies, six or eight ladies were in one, and the rest of the guys were in, in another cell. Kind of, theirs was kind of on a, a diagonal on a corner, and we were about four or five cells down from them. And uh, it was a fun experience. So we're all in, in jail having church, and, and they let us have our Bible, so we're reading Scripture and going around. You had Catholics and Charismatics and Baptist and Presbyterian and every, every stripe and, and make of Christian in, in the cell, so we're all you know, converting each other and telling testimonies and telling stories of what God's done in our life is a, is a good time. We'd sing hymns together. And uh, it got to be a lot of fun because the, the rowdy drunks would come in and the guards would just throw them in our cell. And, uh, and they'd go from being the loudest person in the jail cell to cowering in a corner in about two minutes. As they figured out these radical Christians with Bibles were in here and they didn't know what to do with that. Our door, they just, our door was just left open. They didn't lock our door or anything, you know, and we didn't like roam around this place or anything, but they weren't worried about us walking out, obviously. The ladies were getting processed in. This was after a day or two in jail. We, we'd, we'd been in the cells for a couple of days. And uh, so they were getting their showers and their nice new orange wardrobes and, and everything. They were cleaning out their cell. And so they were, all the ladies were sitting in the hallway or sitting on the floor outside the, the cells there. And so I was able to sit outside our cell and, and uh, talk with Beth. And so we're sitting there talking a little bit about all the events and what God had been doing in respective cells and, you know, just kind of rejoicing at what we were uh, able to be part of. And so I just 
asked her, I said, you know, seeing how we're in bonds for Christ, how do you feel about the bonds of matrimony? And uh, she said she was agreeable to him, but I had to talk to her dad. So <laughs> years later, fast forward to my marriage and sitting in my in-laws home looking through photo albums and I'm looking at this event, the Summer of Mercy, and I see pictures of my mom in their photo album. <laughs> so we didn't even know each other, uh, you know, obviously I had no idea. My wife was probably 13 or something at the time. And, uh, and so my mom and her family had been at the same event together, um, which we found out years later. What did your pro-life ministry look like after you got married? We had babies. <laughs> we raised a family. We have 11 children. And uh, we ultimately lived in Waco. Planned Parenthood moved to Waco. Uh, the Planned Parenthood there, Pam Smallwood, wanted to become the national president. But the problem was she didn't have good uh, creds in the pro-abortion community because her clinic didn't do abortions. And so they wanted to start doing abortions in Waco. So when Beth and I got married, we, we moved to Waco from... I heard from Dallas and me from Houston, and so we got married, and that's where we, we moved. And we did sidewalk counseling um, ministry outside that Planned Parenthood as they started doing abortions. But a handful of folks did a rescue there when they first started doing abortions. And then we launched a sidewalk counseling ministry to, to be on the streets uh, every Wednesday when they were killing children. And we did that for the whole time we were in Waco. And... That still continues to this day, as far as I know. There's still folks that are going out there from, from those early days. This particular story that God wrote into my life, early on I was taking my friend Rusty to the airport in Dallas, DFW airport, from Waco to our drive. So I, I ran him up to the airport. But as I drop him off at the airport and come back out, as I'm coming on the entrance ramp, my tire blows out. Once you hit a highway, you're several miles in any direction from anything a gas station, a fast food restaurant. You have stuff at the airport and you have stuff several miles down any interstate. It's Texas, middle of summer, hotter than blazes. And I, I get out and I'd just come off two days earlier. I, on my way home, there was a storm and I was about a block away from home and I saw this guy running in the rain and I felt like the spirits, you know, like God just said, hey, you should give that guy a ride. I'm like, yeah, well, he kind of ducks in the carport, and he's, you know, I'm like, oh, I mean, he's probably lives there, you know, and I kind of, I just kind of play it off. I felt like it really was God speaking to me, but I was almost home, and I just kind of blew it off. But I felt really deep in my spirit. I felt really convicted, like, I should have given that guy a ride. I don't know why. And it was just one of those weird dynamics at the time. So in the airport, on the way home, I break down. Well, of course, the first story comes to my mind is two days ago, I didn't give this guy a ride, and now I'm needing a ride. And I'm walking down this engine tramp. I'm not 100 feet from the car, and I'm sweating bullets, and it's hot. And I just begin to pray. And I say, God, you know, forgive me if that was you, you know, two days ago, and that was something you were telling me, and I missed that. You know, forgive me. I'm, I was wrong. I'm selfish. I'm a sinner, you know. And I'm, I'm looking out at this interstate, and if you picture a 10 lanes, right, five going each direction, and like every 10-second block, there's 20 or 30 cars, like just massive amount of people traffic. I'm like, Lord, is it not... You know, I know I was wrong, but I know you forgive me. <laughs> Couldn't I begin to bargain for a ride? <laughs> I'm like, God, is there not one person? And these, look at hundreds of cars. Every every few seconds, every 30 seconds, there's probably 100 cars go by. Is there not one person that could hear your voice like I didn't that would stop and give me a ride? I know, I know sooner I got those words out of my mouth than I heard a horn honk behind me. And I turn around, there's a guy in this... I don't know, Oldsmobile looking car, and his car seat in the back with his daughter. I don't know, she's two or three years old, something like that. He pulls over behind me. I get in and he said, yeah, I was, I normally, we just live down this way. I normally go down the service road, but as I was coming up on the entrance, God spoke to me and said, the guy in that car needs a ride. I was blown. I was, I was speechless. I could not utter a word without breaking down and crying like a baby. I'm sitting in the front seat of the car and he drives me, you know, and exit down the road and I get out where I can call my, my mother-in-law. And I just, to this, I feel bad. I feel like I didn't even give him, I, I said, thank you, but I could barely get the words out. And I wanted to tell him this whole story. So maybe he'll hear this one day and, and hear the story <laughs> of what happened. But it was just an amazing story that I think God gave me 
at that time to remind me of the spiritual battle. There, there is a reality to the spiritual forces around us. And, uh, you know, for all I know, that guy was an angel that God just put there for that purpose. Or maybe he's actually a human like us that heard the Spirit of God and was obedient and, you know, gave a poor guy a ride when he didn't deserve it. What did your pro-life ministry look like after you had kids? Uh, when we first moved to Nashville from Texas after our third child, we continued to go out to the streets as we were able. And then uh, as I worked in Green Hills, I, I took every Friday with a couple other friends and we'd go down for lunch. And for five years, we went to Planned Parenthood at lunch and prayed every Friday. And uh, that was the day they were doing abortions. And so we, we took that as an opportunity to go down and minister. And then, of course, at the same time, raising children and raising our family and being pro-life and, and the way we lived our life. I remember one particular guy that was uh, arguing. He's sitting in the car at Planned Parenthood waiting on a girlfriend. And we're out there with the family and, and praying and, you know, trying to talk to people and, and reach out. And just typical sidewalk ministry. And he came over. He got out of his car and he's well-dressed, you know, wealthy family. He's got a nice coat, leather gloves. He gets out and kind of slaps his gloves in his hand and marches over to us like he's going to, you know, show us how wrong we are and how stupid we are and, you know, whatever his motive was. Um, and he comes up and starts engaging. And, uh, you know, one of my sons is like nine. And so this guy is trying to make the case that abortion's okay because we voted for it and it's a, it's a right. And surely if everybody voted, it was okay. And, and so, you know, we start going down the path. Well, what if they voted for to kill one-year-olds or two-year-olds? And my, my nine-year-old son, you know, steps in front of me and says, what if they voted to kill you? He just cut to the chase, you know? And the guy's all, like, blustered and, and all that. And, I, and that, was a, that was a neat, you know, proud dad moment to see my, my child get it and, and understand the logical fallacy this adult, you know, was putting forward and to be able to, to reconcile that in his own mind. But what was unique is he and I just continued talking. We got into personal space, right? Sin and testimony and a little bit of my history and my testimony with abortion. And that just felt God drop in my spirit. So, Because he was giving testimony of his family and his, his upbringing and his, his, his godly family that he came from. And so I finally, I, I just felt the spirit. I said, what is it that, what sin is it that you've committed that has caused you to be at odds with your family? And he shut down. He got angry, visibly changed his face. He turned on his heels and walked back to his car and didn't engage the rest of the day. A few minutes later, the girl comes out. He drives off in a, in a fury. It wasn't a, like a moral victory or something for us. Oh, we got, we, we, we pushed his button, right? It was, hey, God saw through his hypocrisy. He knew exactly why he was out with his family, he knew exactly why he was there at that abortion clinic that day, and knew that he knew that he was wrong. And just by saying those words, the Spirit of God cut to his heart and was working in him far beyond any, any words or any, any great debate skills or anything else any human could do, right? Only the Spirit of God can speak to us like that. After living in Nashville, Paul moved his family out of the city to start a family farm. Over the next 15 years, his family grew, he started a business providing high-speed internet to communities across five counties, and served his local church. His pro-life work continued as he eventually became the president of Personhood, Tennessee. Then, on October 5th, 2022, something happened. What happened on the day you were arrested? I, th I thought I distinctly heard open up FBI, but that sounds like a scene out of a movie, not my front porch. So I made my way to the front door, pulled back the curtain on the door to, to see two agents in full, uh, full gear with long guns and sidearms and vest, Velcro FBI badges across their chest with the, the guy in the back had his sidearm trained on, on me as I looked out the window. And I asked who they were looking for, and they said, you... And I said, well, does, of course, my thought was, does you have a name? You could just very, it could be lots of people. Uh, I didn't have time to really think through that or get a warrant or any kind of identification. As I stepped out, 
I asked for identification. First, I asked under whose authority and if they had any identification. And uh, the little short guy that ended up putting the handcuffs on me and pointed at his Velcro badge and said, this is all the identification you get. And uh, you can get them on eBay today. And uh, anybody could have them. So there wasn't any, they didn't have uniforms. They didn't have, you know, any kind of professional identification that told me that was them. It was all Gestapo fear tactics, banging and intensity, trying to force the agenda that they wanted, of course, was me to surrender. And of course, that was the right thing to do for the sake of my family and for for everything. There was just because they were being bully tyrants doesn't mean that there was any better response than surrendering to them. It just means that they were being bully tyrants and they shouldn't have been. Um, by that point, one of my children had told mommy, the FBI is here and they're arresting daddy. And uh, so Beth comes from the bedroom in the back of where she was with our two-year-old. She came out and they sent her for a sweatshirt. I was in a t-shirt. And so they sent her for a, a shirt or something. And as I was being led down the steps to the, you know, to the unmarked car, the first one. So they put me in the car. And of course, Beth came back out with the camera that has the footage that went national and uh, through all the, uh, the treatment of, of my family after I was in the car. She was wanting to know. She was asking, what are you doing? What is this about? Why are you here? The, the same questions every person in America would want to know if their spouse is being arrested. And the guy's getting his cocky head swing kind of thing going. So you really want to know? You want to know? And it's like literally trying to incite my wife. And, uh, and as soon as she came back with the sweatshirt and had the camera, it's like an instant change in attitude and demeanor. He went, well, ma'am, I'm very sorry. I've tried to tell you and just completely changed his attitude like on the spot. He flicks his, his hand down by his leg. He flips the door back, intentionally slamming it at, at my wife, at Beth. You know, very cocky, arrogant thing, but, but knew he didn't want to get in trouble on camera. Uh, in the car, they once I was in the car, they did show me pull up a computer screen and show me a warrant. And, of course, with no glasses, the only thing I could see with is uh, the one uppercase word on the thing said face. So I knew it was about the FACE Act, and so I figured it was pro-life. But, again, it's been 18 months since the event that was in question. I had no idea, uh, you know, what what was going on or anything about it. The cars drive off with me in it. They met together, and I wish I could remember the code name of the, the spot, the little uh, used car lot in town. It, you know, it's code name Orange or, you know, Spot Alpha or, you know, whatever it was. I, I forget. It was pretty funny. I got a chuckle out of it just hearing them talk about it because they're all, now they're all sounding official, you know, got a crime scene. Uh, but we get there, and they move the handcuffs to the front and put, let me put my sweater on and get ready for the hour and a half ride into Nashville. We, uh, we pulled in downtown Nashville to the new uh, federal courthouse down on Church and 8th, and uh, they went into the Sally Port, you know, where they deliver prisoners and the secure fenced area, and then into the secure uh, lockdown garage. And uh, so they had to shackle and, and manacle me, put foot shackles on me and everything to go to carry me in. So now we're being handed off from the FBI to the um, U.S. Marshal Service, who runs the prison systems. Shuffle myself down the hallway with, you know, twelve-inch steps or whatever the, the manacles were, and uh, and get in the room. And of course, they, you know, take off your shoes and do the search and make sure you're not carrying any weapons that they didn't find on my front porch at seven o'clock in the morning, like I had hidden razor blades or tongue depressors or something in my sneakers. I don't know. The one the one thing that stands out in memory was the uh, they wanted a DNA swab. Like, what do you, what's this for? Well, all federal prisoners have to have a DNA swab. Well, I said, is it required? No, it's required. It, had I known more about what I was facing and dealing with, I would have absolutely refused it and forced them to get a court order to do it. So I went ahead and figured I would fight that in court and try to retrieve my DNA at some point because that's a complete violation of my person. Uh, so I get locked in a nice new prison room with another guy in prison you know, and, and jumper oranges, federal oranges. So he's sleeping, so I a lot of time in the cell to pray and, you know, seek God. And I know it's spiritual battle. And so I wasn't really despondent or upset. Obviously, it's not your favorite place to be when you think you're taking your kids to school and you got work to do. I, was, I had an actual large business meeting to discuss delivering Internet to a county 
in southern western Tennessee and uh, was supposed to be meeting with the mayor and political leaders in that community that morning. And so that's, I was getting ready for all that and had that on the agenda and couldn't call, couldn't cancel, couldn't reschedule, just a no-show. And uh, the business partner that I was working there was was pretty upset. And, of course, the mayor and, and them weren't too, too uh, impressed with my punctuality and my commitment to the uh, project, uh, to say the least. So in jail for a couple of hours, I finally got to see a court-appointed feminist lawyer that was I'm 90% sure it was a complete pro abort that despised even having to talk to me the way she acted. And uh, I, actually, she shared the charges with me. So I found out at that time that it was a face charge for blocking the entrance of abortion clinic, which I never did. And then the add on charge was the conspiracy charge that I conspired with others to do the same. And then she asked about prior arrest and stuff. I said, Yeah, I had, you know, two or three back in the 90s or something. I had some local arrest for pro-life activity back in the 90s. And that was about it. I shuffled back down the hall with the guard to my cell and waited on the FBI to come back. So they transitioned authority, custody, back from the U.S. Marshals back to the FBI for the elevator ride upstairs. So the FBI took me back to the courthouse and went through the arraignment process. It was interesting, the little attorney, you know, the first thing she does is pull up her computer screen that showed five or six arrests in the 90s. And she turns around with this little snobby attitude like and I was like it was the 90s I, I said I had rest then I don't it's 30 years ago I, I knew at the moment that uh as soon as I had the opportunity she wouldn't be representing me long but we uh we made it through the the arraignment the uh judge judge Holmes was the uh magistrate judge that did that you know they're being good guys not seeking custody during the until the hearing well in the not seeking custody you have to go to pretrial release, which is the same as parole. So, so get this, someone who's innocent of anything they're charged with now has the same conditions as a murderer or somebody that's been in federal custody for 5, 10, 30 years and is getting out on parole. I'm now suffering the same indignities as that person. So every month reporting in, um, reporting my income, reporting my travels, limited travel to the Middle Tennessee District without permission from the overlords, while yet not guilty, yet not proven in a court of law to have done anything wrong. The condition was submit to pretrial releases, services, and then also that we could not a, talk to any witnesses and we could not go within 100 feet of a, quote, reproductive health services a building, which I signed the piece of paper and agreed to. And I'm, I'm told then to report to pretrial services the next day. Anyway, sign it and get uh, turned back over to the FBI when the arraignment's done and uh, go back down to be processed out by the U.S. Marshals and then basically get turned out on the street in Nashville with no phone, no wallet, no nothing. Through a series of fun social experiments of asking people to borrow their phone and uh, getting a hold of my wife and trying to connect with her while she's driving and, and uh, at her pastor's house getting prayer and seeking counsel and direction for what to do with her missing husband. Um, we finally make it through the afternoon, you know, and get connected and, and able to get back to the family that night and debrief on everything that happened. How is your wife handling all of this? Wonderfully. She does good. You know, like me, she she has the same challenges. She's human. We all have our, our own human natures and our own uh, giftings and talents and our own weaknesses. As, as we all wrestle with this, we go back and forth. And the, the beauty of things like this is God uses them in our life to strengthen our weaknesses and to take away the, the pride found in our strengths and to make us more rounded, balanced Christians that we can better serve Him. And my wife, like, like myself and the rest of us is, is processing. She's been good, she's been an encouragement, she's bold, I'm very thankful for her strength. Those very things that I saw early on in our courtship and on the streets when we were ministering together and talking with the other uh, Christians are the very things and the very strengths that I see God using in our life and our marriage today. Uh, you can look at the video she recorded uh, the day of the event, I, I challenge a man to find, line up a hundred women and find a handful that are brave enough to 
take the phone out to the FBI car and follow them and call them out for the injustice that is being done. And so uh, I think some of the best marital advice or I guess spouse seeking advice I, I received uh, that I've heard the story of, and I, I don't even know who to give credit for it, but I use it all the time now with other people I know, is that you don't worry as a young single person, don't worry about um, finding a spouse, find God, figure out what your calling is, figure out what you can do to serve and minister in his name and reflect his image in the world and begin running the race that he set before you. And when you keep looking beside you and seeing the same person running beside you, then grab their hand and, and run the race together. And that's the case with Bethany as I was ministering on the streets and she kept being at events I was at. We kept um, ministering in the same manner and showing up at the same places. And it, it just, so she caught my attention and ultimately I grabbed her hand and we kept running. How are your kids doing? The same way mom and dad are handling it, right? We have good days and bad days. We see things like incredible theological breakthroughs and just in immense, incredible things that God is doing. And all the days it's like, how do we pay the bills? How do we live today? Can't even get, you know, the, the car repairs done and, and just living through it. So the, the children are, they're being expanded. They're seeing mom and dad wrestle. They're the secondhand beneficiaries of a measure of grace uh, that is being poured out in the midst of the trial uh, that is ultimately going to be for their good. It's a challenge, but we know that ultimately all things will work for good. And uh, I think they're doing pretty good. They're, they're, we're engaged in school and, and you know, keeping busy doing the things we're supposed to do and growing. And uh, you can ask the question, but ask the question again next week or next month or next year, and it may be completely different. What is it like leading your family through these spiritual battles? Think of what it's like to be a father of 11 in, say, America, 2023, having gone through COVID and come out of COVID and the woke doctrine and everything that's out in the workplace and in the world and just trying to raise your family and trying to teach them to do good things and trying to teach them about their creator and God. It's the same as that except it's a little more intense because they're, the battle is more intense. The truths are the same. Like so much of this battle, it is 10 times harder and it's 10 times easier. It's 10 times harder because the battle's intense and you're, you fight within yourself to be able to, to find the grace and to, to, to deal with the struggles of the day. But then it's 10 times easier because you open the scripture and everything is so applicable. You read, you know, the Beatitudes, and like every one of them has direct application that you can easily point out to your children of how this applies to our family in this time and, and, and all that. Why is this battle worth fighting? You know, one of the petitions that the lawyer made was about Roe being overturned and about the humanity of the babies. You know, the court didn't have jurisdiction uh, in this, that the federal... Government has no jurisdiction in an abortion debate in Tennessee. It was fun. The judge made a comment in there that we are, uh, quote, the defendants are not the moral center of the universe, which I thought was very interesting because she went on to claim by her, by her language and actions that she was. And so it'll be uh, interesting. I think the thing that she misses and the DOJ misses is that there is a moral center to the universe. Is it true that unborn children are human beings created in the image of God? Roe v. Wade was a decision the court made that denied the truth, human beings at conception being made by God in the image of God. So when they're looking at the face bill that was built on the falsity of Roe v. Wade, now they made it a federal crime to go and try to protect the unborn children made in the image of God because they said, no, this is a civil right. It's a codification of falsehood. And so as a Christian, we have an obligation morally to Christ who is the truth first and foremost. And then yes, to obey civil authorities, to obey righteous and just laws. We don't get to pick and choose. It's not like an arbitrary, I'm a Christian, so that doesn't apply to me. So submission to that law, like Rosa Parks 
drinking out of the white water fountain, or I'm sorry, Rosa Parks was on the bus, but a, a black person drinking out of a water fountain that was illegal for them to drink out of the water fountain because it said they're a different class of human. Well, what they ended up doing is they said, well, you know what? We hear your law. We're willing to obey it. It says if I drink out of this fountain, I'm getting a $50 fine or I'm going to jail overnight or whatever. Your terms are acceptable because I'm a human being and I'm going to show that I believe that truth by breaking this law that is not true and I'm going to submit to the authority that you have by putting me in jail. And in suffering that injustice, I'm identifying with the truth that then rebukes this law that is untrue. And so we are not free, for instance, to make a plea bargain, as I've written about, about the plea bargain the court made and said, well, if you just plea guilty to a misdemeanor, then we'll drop these felony charges and we'll let you off with a, you know, no jail time and have a little bit of probation. Well, that'd be great. That's a material victory. Our lawyers rejoice. They got felonies reduced to misdemeanors. We all rejoice. We don't go to jail. A material victory is not what we're after. Uh, we've given our whole life my wife and I and many, many people across the spectrum in the pro-life movement have asked for the end of abortion. Uh, and we've, we've prayed for that end. We've acted to that end. We've gone out and ministered with that desire and that design. The primary issue here is not, you're not choosing a law to be disobedient to. You're bound by a higher law that you must be obedient to. And this law has become in conflict with that law. And now we're duty bound to do that. And if you, justice system, that think that it's necessary to throw us in jail, then that's on you. And but but we're identifying with the truth. How would you say abortion affects the spiritual state of our country? Wow, that's huge. There's so many facets um, to the impact of abortion from, you know, from the individual to the culture, um, you know, to the broader judgments of God that innocent blood brings on a land. You know, one of the things that back in the 90s, a lot of the pro-life movement leaders would say, well, if we don't stop abortion, God's going to judge this nation. And as you read through the Old Testament, the things that stood out to me as judgments were the killing of children, right? The shedding of innocent blood was not going to be a judgment. It was one of the evidences that a nation was under judgment. Uh, weak leaders having no leadership as a sign of judgment from God. You don't have to look too far up, up uh, Constitution Avenue to to see the uh, the judgment. Uh, you know we can we can presume that we're under as a nation from no fault divorce. And Reagan, right, one of our great conservative presidents, was the very first one that gave us no fault divorce. Well, what was that saying? It was devaluing the covenant of marriage that God designed and designed in the garden for men and women to be together, to have strong families so they could, children could depend on mom and dad in the home. You had a lot of that outworking was out of the 60s and 70s, hippies, free love movement, and just sex without consequences, sex without commitment. And of course, that didn't come out of nothing either, that you can go generationally back all the way to Margaret Sanger and beyond and just see kind of the ebbs and flows of culture and, and public thought sentiment. So as we come into the Roe era, Roe v. Wade came out of... The, the free love, love without commitment, basically begin telling the story uh, that, you know, God just wants you to be happy. I'll say it that way because I've heard that so many times in my walk, usually around people getting divorced. It's funny, that's the statement people always make is like, God wants me to be happy and this person's not making me happy, therefore God's okay with divorce. It promises, you know, happiness and then it ultimately leads to more pain and suffering for everybody. So the no-fault divorce, you know, is is directly tied to abortion on demand. And so as you begin to have people demanding that, you got we have to understand and assess that they, they didn't think that it's a great idea to go out and kill my children. What they said was, I want to be free to do what I want. I want what I want, when I want it, how I want it, and I don't want any repercussions for that. Basically, I don't want any God. I want to be my own God the same lie from the garden, I will decide for myself what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. And I'll make, I'll be the, you know, what is that? I'm the determiner of my own fate, the master of my destiny. And as that moves on, then that becomes everyone 
now has this secret sin of abortion or now has this baggage of abortion or divorce and the other sins related to that. And so now when the public discourse is going on and people are talking, their presupposition is, well, I have to I have to push this right for abortion because I've already participated in it or I've already have a friend that did or my daughter did or my name the person. And so now the public sentiment begins to take on what it firmly rejected as a lie early on, but as individuals begin practicing and, and walking in this step, you know, what's the, uh, the passage of what was once uh, rejected now becomes demanded. And so it's really interesting to see. I don't know that there's ever been a nation that has recovered from child sacrifice and homosexuality and the sins that we see in our nation. And so it'll be interesting to see as a culture if we survive the overturn of Roe v. Wade and the reversing of the engines, if we can actually come through this in one piece as a nation, or if it takes a, you know, usually war and, and lots of other tragedies are associated with the unwinding of an evil practice of a culture and a people as God takes them into the proverbial woodshed. He'll use evil rulers to reform our thoughts where we've gone astray and to bring us back into conformity with actual truth. So as a culture, we can ascribe to truth or we can ascribe to lies, and just like we can as individuals. When we share our testimony, it's not, oh, I walked down the Baptist church aisle when I was 12 and said this prayer. That, that, that's great. Great first step. It's, it's the steps going back up the aisle and every step since then that is the testimony of what God's doing and has done in your life. What do you want to make sure your family knows before going into the trial? You know, it's, it's funny. I got a friend that says of his children, he's raising martyrs for Jesus. And I always thought that was way extreme. He couldn't get there from here. It's like, yeah, but... Yeah, I want them to go to heaven. I want them to be good soldiers for Jesus, but intentionally making, trying to train them to be martyrs. This is not the first century. Come on. But yet, martyrdom and persecution takes on so many different forms. And there's a spiritual truth in training that mindset of understanding that spiritual battle that I think is vitally important. You know, for my children, I would I would say... You know, the, first and foremost, there is a God, there is no other. He is true and right and good. And in spite of all the troubles and all the things this world could bring to us, He is still true and right and good. And there is no other. If I go to jail or don't go to jail, if I'm found innocent or guilty, whatever happens in this material world, if COVID comes and wipes out half of, of Tennessee, if war comes and there are nuclear bombs dropped on friends and families that we know, whatever happens in this world, it cannot and does not change. There is a God and there is no other. He created us, He loves us, and our duty, no matter what, is to follow Him. So Simon, if I'm remembering the story right, carried the cross of Christ. And I forget in Acts, the son's name, I believe one was Alexander, but the way it's stated in Acts is really interesting because it doesn't say the sons of Simon, as in everybody knew Simon and didn't know his sons, but they said Alexander and, and, and the other son's name, whose father was Simon. In other words, they were more well known than the father was. And this is the guy that carried the cross for Christ. And so what is it they did beyond what their father did that made them so well known that people knew their names. And I would say for my family, for my children, take what little sacrifices I've made, take the blessings of God and stand on my shoulders and go further, do more, be used of God, be content with where he places you. It's not measured in material, worldly measuring sticks. It's a, it's a spiritual inheritance that can be spent uh, to advance the kingdom of God. Thank you for listening. Go to stifledcry.com to support this project.